Well, we're almost there. We're almost there for most of us, many of us, to keep the annual Passover. And we know that old saying, the biblical saying that meat in due season, and it is meat in due season to talk today about the upcoming Passover and those of us who will be keeping that annual event each year. The Passover is ordained by God and it is sealed and consecrated by the blood of Jesus Christ. When you understand the Passover story and you truly understand its importance to our lives, you cannot walk away and not realize just how important that sacrifice not only was, but is, because it's an ongoing sacrifice. I'm going to ask two questions today in this message and seek to answer those two very basic questions. And though very basic questions, yet I hope to put some depth to them and to have some more clear understanding, deeper understanding as we observe this Passover. If you, if you title the sermon, title it, Prepare to Keep the Passover. Prepare to keep the Passover. The two questions I want to ask, how do you prepare for it? For those of us who are baptized, and it is for baptized members, how do you prepare for it? And as almost any subject I give, I personalize those subjects. I find that no matter what subject I choose, to me, it's very personal, every subject. And I hope that each time you hear a message, that you receive any message you hear from anyone given from the lectern, that you personalize it because that's what it's supposed to do. The second question, how do you observe it? Two very basic but profound questions that you answer. How do you prepare for the Passover? And then how do you observe it? And I want to go into these two aspects today, try to answer these two questions in this message. So question number one, how do you prepare for it? If someone were to ask you that question, how do you prepare for the Passover? Many might say, well, I'll read these parts of the Gospels. I'll read about Christ. I'll read about that last 24 hours. There are many ways one could send, simply answer it, I'm sure. But in its more profound uh, saying it or nature of saying it, how do we really prepare for it? Because actually Passover, to prepare for it properly, involves every day of our life. It involves every day for the past year. How did we how did we process and live each day of our past year? And how will we live the day after Passover and the day after that and the next week and the next month? How do we live each day? Because that's the true Passover lesson. Are we living truly and being sealed by that very blood of Jesus Christ? I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, so basic, Paul's words here, and when I said Romans 3, I'm always aware that there are those of you who are truly biblical students that you probably exactly know, well, I think I know where he's going, and you're right. Romans 3, because you won't find, starting in verse 23, how do you prepare for Passover? Where do we start? What is that first thoughts that should enter our mind and we read here the apostle paul's words romans 3 verse 23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus whom god set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, that is the Christ. So we see right away that all have sinned. No one can lay claim to living a life 
free of sin. We have all transgressed. We have all sinned. We all bear responsibility for those sins and transgressions. And so no one can lay claim to the fact that they can do it on their own. Only through and by the blood of Jesus Christ can we be passed over. And what does it mean to be passed over ultimately? What is that true being passed over? Death. Death is passed over from our life. We are removed from what I've always loved to use the expression. We are removed from death row. Because we were sitting, you might say, in that theoretical manner, in that allegorical way to say, we were sitting on death row until God, through Jesus Christ, through repentance and baptism, that we came to that new state of being, that new life. And that new life in us is inherent from above. That new life is not of this earth. It's not of this world. It's from the other world, that world that is above, that most high place in the universe where the Father and Jesus Christ sit. And only through those means and only through that process can we receive justification. There is nothing that we can do in the flesh, no works that we can do enough of that will justify us. And this is what Paul is saying in those words there to the church at Rome long ago. So, just as ancient Israel that night... And picture that night, picture for a moment in your minds that night when that 10th plague was poured out in Egypt. And when that 10th plague was poured out from midnight past and it went through the land, all of Egypt and all the firstborn of all human beings died. I want you to think about that for a moment. Every firstborn of all humans died that night. And also all firstborn of all living things died that night. There was great carnage throughout all the land that night. And Israel, behind their doors of protection, could hear the shrieks and the cries and the groans and the moanings and the great uproar from all the death that was happening around them. And the only reason they were protected in their homes, as I hope you know the story from Exodus chapter 12, is... From that death angel, and that's what we've always used that term, the death angel coming through, the death plague coming through, the only thing that saved Israel behind those closed doors of their abodes was the blood that had been put over the doorpost of their homes and by the sides, the lentils, and over the doorpost. And only that blood protected them. That was the old covenant. That was the old letter of the law operation process. But what is it now when we turn the script and when we flip the script and we talk about the new covenant? What is it that protects us? What is it that seals us, protects us from death, ultimate death? Because again, Romans 6.23, the apostle Paul says the wages of sin is death. The only thing that protects us ultimately from dying, especially the second death, is repentance, baptism, and that covenant to where we are sealed by a contract written and signed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that blood is theoretically over our doorpost of our dwelling as he lives and dwells not only with us, but in us. As Christ lives and dwells in us. And if Christ lives and dwells within us, that means the Father does too. Because John 14 verse 23 says that we will come to make, that is my Father and I will come to make our home with those who keep the commandments. That's John 14 verse 23. As that death plague went through that night and killed all the firstborn, and the only thing that protected and sealed them in protection in their own places of abode was that, again, of that blood over their doorposts and beside their doors. And Jesus Christ, the blood of that covenant, Christ signed off on that new covenant by his very blood. 
by his very sacrifice. These are things to the mature spiritual mind here today. And those of you listening in right now, and those of you who will listen into this message later, and those who will listen to it when it goes on the website, because most of these messages are going on public websites, which means that people anywhere and everywhere can have access to these messages. And so I say to any that hear it, only through and by the blood of Jesus Christ, who is truly the Passover. He is truly the Passover, the Passover Lamb of God. And only through and by that means can we have redemption and justification. We accept as we prepare for Passover. Those of us who have taken on that new life, those who have been repentant and baptized, those who have said that we will endure to the end and love and obedience and fidelity to God in Christ. We have said we will honor this until death do us part. We who have accepted that and taken full responsibility as we prepare for this upcoming Passover, we also must understand and acknowledge that we are the ones. Each one of us is the one who put him to death. This is a profound understanding that I don't think sometimes we think about or want to even think about. But we have to acknowledge personally, each one of us, as we come to Passover and partake of these symbols again, and we go through that service and we commemorate, we remember, and we, as a memorial as well, and we come to it in a somber mood, and yet there is a celebratory mood as well. Brethren, there is a type celebratory mood to Passover as well, because we get to what? Partake of this with our Lord and Savior. And we will one day, as he said at that last, our first Passover, our last one that he did with the disciples, I will once again in the kingdom one day share this cup with you again. This, this type of a consummation when that church and the saints one day will be consummated as the bride forever. But we have to understand that he paid the ultimate price of death. And not only death, but a horrible death, a horrible suffering for 24 hours that he went through, the interrogations, the, the, the flogging, the, the, the scourging, the, the being spat upon, mocked. I mean, when you take it all into account, he didn't have to do any of that. I wrote the personal this past Tuesday night. He did it willingly. He laid his life. He came willingly and laid his life down. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. The father didn't have to twist his arm. Christ did it willingly. How willing are we sometimes to then do what we are told and commanded and asked to do by God? Our hands, our sinful nature, our sins, our transgressions put him to death. We put him on that stake. We put him on that cross. We put him through that. Our sins, our transgressions. Who killed Jesus Christ? He had a good sermon here last week about that. Mr. Betts gave a good message about that. But it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the Jews who killed him, the Romans who killed him, the Roman soldier. All of it doesn't really matter in the sense that we all are responsible. Each one of us for the very death of Jesus Christ. Each one of us. Our hands were theoretically on that hammer. That drove those spikes nails into his flesh. And that brings it home very personal. Does it not? He lived a perfect life. And he came and he paid a high price. For each one of us. He paid the highest ransom that's ever been paid or can ever be paid. He paid that ransom to rescue us from death. Brethren, in the moment, these things are not in my notes. He rescued us. This was not in my notes. And it's just coming in my mind right now. Rescue is another way to say through repentance, we are rescued. 
and only rescued ultimately through repentance by the very shed blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because there is nothing, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how good I think I am, we are nothing there is nothing in our physical being, mind, heart, and soul. There is nothing that can justify us. We could be the most perfect law keepers in the world in our own mind. We can, we can toe the line spiritually each day. And we can think coming to the end of a week, boy, we've done a great job this week. Didn't lose my temper one time. Didn't lose my patience. Boy, am I justified today. And yet there is nothing as I speak, as frank as I know how, we can do nothing to justify ourselves. And that's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 3. Those verses we read, flesh of itself is hopeless. And without Jesus Christ having come, and a plan that was put in place, where the Godhead, the Godhead that has existed for eternity, the Godhead put a plan into place. And we don't know how far back they determine that they're going to have a family. Because that's, again, the, one of the greatest things we understand, I uh, hope, that we still do and never lose that sight, that God is putting together a family. He wants family, and He wants family for eternity. And so somewhere long ago, they put together, that is the Godhead, together, put a plan together. And one of them had to come down and get dirty with our sins in the sense of be exposed to sin and yet never sin. And the one who became Jesus Christ did come down and spent 33 and a half years as flesh to identify with us and to bring ultimately that opportunity by what he did, not only opportunity to receive down payment ultimately on eternal life through and by the spirit impregnation into our very minds and hearts, but ultimately will give us the entire future of eternity. That is the ultimate gift through it all. When you look at the whole plan of salvation, that ultimate gift is to ultimately say, we, that is the father in Christ, we are willing to give you eternity. In return, we asked only this. But that only this is huge. That you love us with all of your heart, mind, and soul. And it's never changed from that. God inspired Moses, the one who is the I am, inspired Moses to write that under the old covenant. It's always been such. God has always asked for our love. And that love entails obedience. And that means also to live repentant lives. He paid the highest price that could ever be paid. Have you ever thought about, as you prepare for Passover, have you ever thought about the fact that when he left the throne of God, when he left there in the third heaven and came to earth and was born of a woman, John 3, 16, we know the scripture so well that God says he sent his only begotten son that all those who believe may be saved. Stop and consider, if you remove that word believe, you have basically the false teaching of come as you are. God doesn't ask us to come as we are. God asks us to come to him in repentance. That is a heresy taught by so much of mainstream religion. Those who would believe would be saved. What does that word believe mean? It means active. It means real active repentance, changing one's life, converting to something that you've never been. That is the salvation way. That is the way of salvation. And then to accept responsibility for what we each put Christ through. And that's how we have to see it as we prepare to observe this Passover. 
We can't just come to this Passover thinking, well, the Jews killed him, the Romans killed him, or the soldier killed him with the spear. None of that. What we have to consider most of all is who really is responsible. And you look into the mural and you see who that person is. It is I. What about, do, do any, don't answer the question. Do any of you have ongoing sins right now? Don't answer that. Do I? We know the answer to that. We each one in this room, those listening in, we know the answer to that. That means we need a living Savior. Because we do transgress and sin almost every day in some way or the other. There's a small piece of leaven as we will keep the day soon of unleavened bread. There's always that hidden leaven in our life that we don't see. A piece of leaven that others can see it in us, but we don't always see it. He left glory behind. He left heaven's glory behind and was born of a woman, became flesh and lived with us. That is humanity among us. And that title of Emmanuel, which means God with us. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. Because of how well that it is put. Philippians chapter 2. Let you get there a moment. Starting in verse 6. Philippians chapter 2. Starting verse 6. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. It cannot be put more succinctly, more plainly. It was he died he died a criminal's death because, again, you do understand he was handed over into Roman hands and he died a Roman crucifixion reserved for criminals. It was all by design. The God of heaven never does one thing by happenstance. God never once, never in eternity has he ever done anything but just happenstance. God is a God of such magnitude of mind and thought that we can't even comprehend. Everything God does has, can we say, rhyme and reason and purpose, design. Everything God does has design and purpose. I won't get into it today, and I wouldn't say too much sometimes because some of you might say he's preaching predestination and running out these doors on me. But there is more to certain things of what he has predestined for some of us and a lot of us than we've ever realized. Did God at some point determine to call you? Any of you listening, any of you here today, did he at some point determine you, determine to call you, but he delayed your calling for a while for a reason? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God there again knows exactly when he's going to call each person. And basically the why he will wait sometimes and call some and then others he'll call sooner. <clears throat> We see here from these words that Christ was what? He left his divinity, laid it aside, and came and dwelt with us. He endured toil and suffering and pain and sorrow. Isaiah 53 tells us, and I'm sure many of you, if not already, will be reading Isaiah 53, those words in that chapter about the Savior and what he went through. And it says there in that chapter 53 of Isaiah, he was a man of sorrow. He experienced much sorrow in his life. Who created humanity? Who created us? Who did the creating again in Genesis? The recreation of the earth. 
Because earth, the Genesis account, was a recreation. It was not the original. Who did the creation? Who created Adam? Who took woman out of man? Woman out of Adam and fashioned her from one of his ribs. Who did all that? The one who became Jesus Christ. And so this Jesus Christ came down, the I am, the, the old. He came down, born of a woman himself, and lived among us, lived among the very ones that he himself had created. Is that not fascinating? Came down and became very up close and personal with his greatest creation. And that was humanity. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is the ultimate destiny through Christ that we have promised to us. The ultimate destiny, the ultimate promise that we have that one day will be fulfilled. That because of what he did, and that is in Ephesians 1 starting verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, there's that word believed again, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. When I read those words that Paul right there to the church at Ephesus, when he says, until the redemption of that purchased possession, you know what just popped into my head? When Christ takes his bride when he returns. When Christ comes for his bride, that appointed time until that point of redemption, because that's when we're going to be changed. As we will meet him in the clouds and we will be changed and we will be made immortal. The purchased possession, which we are now, becomes fully redeemed to glory. And we shall be from that point on, wherever he goes, we shall be with Christ from that point wherever he goes, as the bride of Christ. We are waiting as that purchased possession for that ultimate redemption. And that ultimate redemption is to have glory bestowed upon us, to be glorified as Christ is glorified. That's not to say to have the same equal glory, but to be glorified as he is glorified and we shall see him as John says in the epistle, we shall see him as he is at that time because we can then behold him in his power and glory because we will be glorified as his brethren, as his sisters and brethren now turned from corruptible to incorruptible when mortality puts on immortality. Beautiful promise there. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. These letters that were written to the churches by these apostles long ago. Paul here, writing this letter to the church at Colossae. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 13. He has delivered us. From the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Very clearly expressed here. And then you drop, drop down to verse 19. For it pleased the father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him. Whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. That is when we were once in our sins and bondage, we were in bondage to human sins and transgressions. And in essence, to put it very succinctly and plainly, when those sins and transgressions were controlling us and we were in bondage to them and Jesus Christ and through and by that blood and that sacrifice and through repentance, we were rescued. 
from who we were. In the body, verse 22, of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. And then you have that big little word starts verse 23. If, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. That is, if you remain faithful, if you remain steadfast, if you have staying power, you tie the knot at the end of the rope and hang on and never turn loose. That's what it is being said as Paul long ago to Ephesus, that first church that he spoke and that letter went to them, that first church, Ephesus, the one in Revelation who lost their first love. We must never lose that first love for God and what he's doing in our life. So we prepare for the Passover, remembering these things, being reminded of all these things that I speak of today. And it's not just what he did as we come and prepare for the Passover. It's not what he did only, but maybe most importantly, it is what he, he is doing now. He is a living savior. It is what he is doing now. That matters the most. It is what he is doing in your life and my life daily. And what he will do. Not only in the lives of those that will be called and converted. Right up until his second return. But that same process that will be active in the thousand year millennium. And that same process that will go through the great white throne judgment. Through the second resurrection. And that whole time frame of what we call the great white throne judgment from the scriptures. This whole process will be ongoing until that last person, so to speak, walks through the door into eternity. God has a plan in each time frame and order for as many ones in the human race to walk through that door into eternity. And through the whole plan of salvation... While we go through these holy days each year that typify and show and picture that. And by the time we get to that eighth day, that final time, that final time of salvation. And that time frame is over. And we see New Jerusalem in chapter 21 and 2 of Revelation coming down finally. And God the Father dwelling with his totally new minted family. When one day God himself, the father, will come to dwell with his family in New Jerusalem. It's a beautiful story. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. As we prepare to keep the Passover. Let us be reminded of these words by the writer of Hebrews. You know, it doesn't matter again whether Paul wrote Hebrews or whether Luke did. Or Apollos, long ago I studied, I studied into this long ago, who wrote Hebrews, and nobody I don't think knows for sure, but you know what we know for sure? It's inspired. And that's really in the end all we need to know, it's inspired. And what inspired words we read here in Hebrews 9 verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh... How much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself... Notice that. Offered himself. Again, willingly. He willingly allowed himself to be an offering. Without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. What we read Paul's words there in Ephesians, the ultimate promise of what he did, everything that he did and what he's doing now, all of it ultimately 
the ultimate destiny, the ultimate return that we get as the saints of God from that is eternal destiny, eternal inheritance. That means eternal life. That's the ultimate promise. If you put salvation somehow up on a chalkboard, as we you say, the old chalkboard proverbial, you put it on a chart, whatever. Where are we all headed? Where is that ultimate finish of it all? What is the ultimate finish of the whole thing? What is the whole end game? What is the whole plan? Where do we finish? What is the finish line? That we are born eternal one day. And we say goodbye to the flesh forever. I've already got the sermon finished for the last holy day. And I will talk about the bondage that we have escaped from if we are repentant. These are things as we prepare for Passover that I wanted to talk about. The second part of the question of the sermon. The second question. How do you observe it? And you think, well, that kind of sounds the same as, well, you say, how do you prepare for it? But now we actually are coming to that point of observing it. So how do you observe the Passover? Let's go back to the original Passover, Exodus chapter 12. Go back to Exodus chapter 12. That original Passover, that Passover that they did that night, and they did, and they commemorated a 14th Passover. Passover. They did a 14th Passover. Perhaps I'll take time this week. Perhaps we shall see to write a personal and make it a little bit longer and maybe go through a little bit of a timeline because there's still confusion out here in this world about keeping a 14th or a 15th Passover. They kept a 14th Passover. Christ kept a 14th Passover with his disciples. And perhaps it's time that I'll write something this week about that. And perhaps I will. I feel very strong about that. We're here at the original Passover that had been enacted there in Egypt. Let's drop down to verse 43, chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No outsider shall eat of it. Now, as I go through these verses and you follow along with me, you'll be able to extrapolate and be able to understand under the old covenant who could and who could not take the Passover. As you're going through these reading along with me, you will begin to frame in your mind, no doubt, the spiritual application under the new covenant. And I will get to that shortly. Verse 44, every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. Verse 45, a sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house, it shall be eaten. You shall not um, carry out any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. Do you see that, brethren? You won't break one of his bones, not one of the bones. They were not to break one of Jesus Christ's bones. Not a bone was to be broken. That was brought out last week, I think, in Mr. Beth's sermon. That prophecy, you see the same words. Christ was not to have one bone broken, and he didn't. Okay? All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger sojourns with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all of his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land or as that would be a citizen for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Thus all the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. So it came to pass on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to the armies. So we see the strict regulations that no uncircumcised person should be taking the Passover. But I'm going to say something today that may kind of shock you. Circumcision is still required to take the Passover. Nobody ran out. Circumcision is still required to take the Passover. But what circumcision? What type circumcision? It's so ironic that 
again when Moses wrote the book, Deuteronomy, the last of the five called the Torah by the Jews, the book of the law, those five. And he wrote Deuteronomy and the whole flavor of Deuteronomy again is has so much of the new covenant essence woven throughout that book of Deuteronomy. The word heart, heart is mentioned again more times in the book of Deuteronomy than all the other four books of the law put together. Why is that? Because after 40 years, Moses, God had instructed Israel the whole time. Let these things be in your heart. Love me with all your heart, mind, being, and soul. It always from God carried that new covenant type thinking. And Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. You can jot it down. I'll quote it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Inspired of God. Direct inspiration from the one who became Jesus Christ. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff necked no longer. <laughs> be rebellious no longer. Be resistant no longer. Do not resist me, your God, your creator any longer. You know what I hear when it says be stiff necked no longer? And we know what stiff necked is. Don't want to listen. Stubborn. Resistant. Hostile. Romans 8 7. Carnal minds, carnality is hostile to the very nature of God. That's Romans 8, 7. It's always been this way. God has always asked us to do everything from the heart. <laughs> Maybe it's double speak. The heart of the new covenant is the heart. It is at the heart of it. They want our love. They want our submission, our surrender, our fidelity. And if they have to, so to speak, twist our arm to get us to do it. That's not how God in Christ operates. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. <laughs> what do we see, brethren? Do we see it just oozing with language of the new covenant? Deuteronomy was a book, was writings of Moses way ahead of its time. Deuteronomy, that last book of the law, written by Moses to say, remember, and that's what the book of Deuteronomy, theologians know it to be, where Moses said, I'm going to write this and call it a book of remembrance. All that I have taught you for 40 years that God has said, Moses, teach them, teach them this. And he puts it in that final book called Deuteronomy. And it was a forerunner, a new covenant type book, letter, what have you. God is saying to remove the darkness from your being. Come into the light. Step into the light. When we are called and God by his spirit calls us. And that light begins to shine into our hearts and minds. And it begins to open our hearts and minds. It begins to not just give us knowledge. Because again knowledge is no good if we don't act on it. Knowledge will never do any of us any good if we don't put that knowledge into use. So he shines that light into our minds and hearts through a calling. But then he wants, can I say it so simply that these children can understand it, is that the light will stay on. <laughs> the light will stay on. Tom Bodette will leave the light on. I just thought about that. We'll leave, God says, I'll leave the light on. We extinguish the light of his calling. If the light of your calling is growing dimmer, you are the one responsible. If the light of your calling is growing dim, if there is a darkness creeping back into your life, it is you. It is what you're not doing. If darkness is creeping back in and you sense it, you realize it, you need to pray about it and do something about it. Because believe you me, 
the devil right now and his, the demonic powers are the most active they've ever been. And they're going to continue to create more and more darkness. So we are the ones responsible again for protecting what he has given us. God has been through a process called salvation. Reserving the right to call those. John 6, 44, It is the father who calls. The family is being literally put together through spans of time. And the church of the living God through time immemorial has basically always been a small persecuted flock. That is a truism. I cut my spiritual teeth on my mentors teaching me that from the scriptures when I grew up. History proves it out. The church, the true church, has always been, through the ages, pretty much that smaller remnant that has been persecuted and shall be again. What kind of a heart do we have? When we read to circumcise our heart, to remove that covering, when I hear and read that word covering, I think, what has hardened your heart? What is causing your heart to be hardened against the things of God? Remove that veil. Remove that veil of darkness. What happened when Christ died? The moment he died, what happened in the temple? That veil was torn from top to bottom, removed. It was removed. And for the first time also benefits of that sacrifice, our Passover lamb, that from that time on until now and always, we have free access right into the throne room, right into the Holy of Holies. Brethren, that's where they are. That's where they sit. The true Holy of Holies is where they sit on their thrones and that angelic realm around them and the 24 elders and those four living creatures. That scene in Revelation 5 and 4 and 5 that gives that depiction that John saw in vision. That's where they dwell. The highest point of the universe. They dwell at the highest point echelons of the universe. Can any mathematician in here or listening in, can you tell me how far God's throne is from earth? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And frankly, it's none of our business. If we knew exactly how far it was to his throne, had he laid it out in scripture. Uh, one quick spiritual caveat to give all of you footnote to some of this. If we knew a whole lot more certain things we want to know more about, where would faith be? Why would we need faith? What is faith? When you bring faith down to its truest, most profound element, it is believing in that which you cannot see. Hebrews 11.1 1 brings that out. It is those things that are invisible that we cannot see. But when we believe in that which we cannot see and yet have that hope that they shall be, that's when faith becomes strong. Faith is not faith if we can see it and touch it and hold it. We cannot reach out right now and touch the kingdom of God. We cannot feel it. We cannot touch it. We don't see it. It's not here yet. But faith and hope assures us that it's there. It's going to be there. And we hold on and cling to that hope, do we not? Psalms 51 verse 17. Psalms chapter 51 verse 17. That's that Psalm of prayer, chapter 51 of Psalms is David's prayer of repentance after the sins with Bathsheba and the child and Uriah and all that. Here is what God's looking for. A circumcised heart, a broken heart, a contrite heart that David speaks of there in that verse 17. And I hear my ears, what my ears hear when I read and I see a broken, contrite heart. I see a heart that's melted to God. I see a heart receptive to God. I see a heart that is softened. I see a heart that's like a sponge. It soaks up everything. Most of all, it is a heart that loves God and gives God true, unadulterated love. And is not willing to have affairs with any other source other than the true fidelity to be faithful to God in all things unto death. 
It's just like you make all of us who are married in this room. Every one of us I hope in this room. And I know there are divorces that happen sometimes. That there are causes, reasons, whatever in that sense. But God never deemed it so. God wanted a man and a woman. A husband and a wife. To marry and live and experience a lifetime together. That's what he wanted. Okay. Why did he give them a bill of divorce? It's right there in scripture. I won't go to it. What did he say? Because of the hardness of your own hearts. We cause ourselves the most problems. Whoever you're sitting across from beside right now, don't look at each other. But neither, no one in this room, no one listening in again, none of you are the other's biggest enemies. Again, the biggest enemy is the person that is sitting there in front of me and me. I'm the biggest problem I have. I got all I can do to take care of trying to get my life in order spiritually as I should. And that speaks for each one of us. Repentance. It is the clarion message, brethren. I tell you, the more I think about the coming prophets, and they are coming. I don't know when. God will send prophets, true prophets. They will come. I don't know how, how soon. I, I'm starting to think they're going to be probably sooner than later because of the way this world's looking. And you know, when they come, they're going to call it out. They're not going to hesitate to call government leaders out. And all those who are in transgression, but they're also going to call out, first and foremost, the church. The church, the church must always be the first to hear the warning. The church must always be the first ones to have ears to hear. Not only to hear the words of salvation. But to hear the clarion call of warning. Because the gospel message carries a very inherent warning message as well. I could say, paraphrasing from scripture, and you would agree. If you don't repent, such and such will happen. If we don't repent, we can only expect the consequences of those things to happen. We observe Passover with a circumcised heart that means and should say to us that we are cleansed when we repent by God's forgiveness to us. So we come to that special event and we observe it with a heart of forgiveness, knowing that God has forgiven us. He has what? Through Jesus Christ, by that shed blood, of that sacrifice, has atoned for our sins. And so if we are in that state of being, in a spiritual state of being, then we are cleansed and we take that Passover with thankfulness and a type of a celebratory mood as well and attitude of, look what he did for me and look what he did for us. And yet when we look forgiveness in the eye, we're told without time to go there from the clock, as I look at that clock, we're told if we are forgiven, then we are to turn around and forgive others. We cannot have the luxury of coming to Passover with hardness of heart, animosities or resentments against others. Not one. When you take that wine and you take that bread and you do that foot washing. If we are harboring resentment, animosity, hostility against one person then you in that sense, and get me, and understand clearly what I say, if you come to Passover, and you have not cleansed your own heart, and mind in being of animosity towards someone, and resentment, and even possibly hatred, then you are in that spiritual sense, taking it in an unworthy manner. Forgiveness is at the heart of the Passover. Forgiveness is at the heart of Christianity. It is at the heart of salvation. Forgiveness is heart and core because with us not having been forgiven, none could walk through that door. But because we've been forgiven and all made possible by the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. Turn to Mark 11. Mark 11. Mark 11, chapter 11. Verse 25. 
Jesus Christ says it very plainly here. As we come to observe the Passover, remember this. Whenever, verse 25, Mark 11, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. What can I add to that? Jesus Christ says it plain. If you haven't forgiven, then you are, my words, on dangerous ground. I will just quote from the model prayer from Matthew 6, verse 9 through 15. Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 15 is the Lord's prayer and that model prayer as we call it too. What is such a big part of that prayer? Is debts being forgiven and then you turning around and forgiving the debts of others? Do we see even how in that, and I'll just turn to it if you want to, turn to Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew 6. I mean, where are you, where are y'all going for the next three hours anyway? Okay. Matthew 6. Let me just quickly read through it. Matthew 6 and follow along with me. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We see what's at the heart and core of this model prayer. That we first acknowledge God, our Father in heaven. We acknowledge the supreme being in the universe. And then the narrative moves in the prayer, the model prayer, forgiveness. Not only the forgiveness that we receive and being thankful every day that we can receive that forgiveness through and by Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. But did we turn around and balance the book, so to speak, spiritually by forgiving others? Brethren, I've lived my life and I see it still. My mind cannot wrap around a heart that becomes so hardened in unforgiveness to other people. I see it now. I've seen it all my life. I continue to see it where I know ones, those who I love, who, whose hearts are so hard, they cannot, will not forgive others. Our hearts have to be cleansed of all animosity against one another it doesn't in the end game it doesn't matter what you think so and so said to me did to me in the end game God says forgive forgiveness is at the heart of this Passover story because without forgiveness we have no hope without Christ and that sacrifice and shed blood and it applied to our life we have no hope we're dead men walking. Not a one of us can afford to clutch and hold on to those debts. That is those grievances, those offenses, those trespasses that somebody said something to me, somebody did something to me, and I'm not going to turn it loose. I'm not going to let it go. If you come to Passover with those kind of attitudes, you are taking the Passover in that sense, in an unworthy manner. Let's go to Paul's words as I begin to wrap this message. 1 Corinthians 11. I would venture to say that if you haven't gone, most of us, to 1 Corinthians 11 already, you will have gone there before Passover. Because we come to Paul's words to the church at Corinth here, and these are some of the most prominent words we read at Passover, even sometimes right at Passover. Let's just start in verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. So Paul's dealing with the divisions and 
disunity there in the Corinth church at that time, and they were full of it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and others not. We know we do not do. We don't do the full supper. The Passover New Covenant is that symbols we take at that Passover. We keep that New Covenant Passover with those symbols. And Paul's covering that here in these verses. He says, verse 22, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Paul's making it pretty clear this new covenant Passover was not to be that type of a meal, what have you. They came together to keep those symbols. As Christ introduced those symbols at the end of that supper that night, Christ introduced those first symbols of that first Passover as they had ended, was ending supper that night, so to speak. I want to drop to verse 23. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. That means you are what? You are under grace. You are under grace. You are being what? Prepared one day to receive eternal life. Therefore, verse 27, you see Paul kind of changes the narrative a little here. Therefore, whoever though eats this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. Brethren, I've read that for years and it's kind of troubled me because I seem to discern what Paul is saying. For this reason, many of you are sick and even dying. You do not understand, he says. You do not understand the Lord's sacrifice as you need to and should. And you're paying the consequences through even physical sickness and suffering and death at times. This is what Paul is saying. Passover is serious. It's a night to come before them in the third heaven. They will be watching. They will be observing every service held. That they have put their stamp of approval on. And notice how I said that. There are counterfeits. There are counterfeit Passovers being done. Everywhere too. Notice I said they will be observing. Those Passovers. That meet their approval. Not our own personal desires. To create the type Passovers that we want to create. That fit the narrative that we want to create. Most of you understand I hope where I'm coming from. If we judge ourselves, verse 31, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. We see here the emphasis that Paul is putting on that Passover is to come reflective, to come examining your, oneself, to come understanding what that blood Sacrifice, that sacrifice total of Christ means. And when we do understand the totality of it, as I've trouble, tried to just cover just what I call snippets of it today. I mean, I've just covered in about an hour and five minutes of thing already. I've just covered snippets of it. I've just tried to hit some of those basic profound highlights. What does it mean to drink and take the Passover in an unworthy manner? I hope today that I've given enough evidence that we can reflect on, examine ourselves. And consider, and consider that. Those of you who will take Passover, when we take that Passover this week and we do the foot washing, as you're doing that foot washing ahead of time, I will mention, do so with a heart of service. Understand, be reflecting now that when we will come to that first portion of the foot washing, it literally means that we bow in servitude and service to one another 
as Christ knelt that night and washed all of their feet and said, if I be your Lord and master and I do this for you, how much more you should do it for one another. And it means, it means simply in the greatest way I can say it is we don't put self first. We learn a life of service to put others first. That's what it all means. Christianity, to be a disciple of Christ, Christ put others first. Christ didn't ever put himself first. When you partake of that bread this week, it will be that tiny little piece of bread that we will imbibe of, but with such profound meaning that we will be literally partaking of the living manna from heaven, Christ. That living bread, that living bread, being that is our daily intercessor, that is our daily high priest, that is the one daily that with the Father is watching over us. Revelation, the message to the seven churches there, and that verse where Christ is said to be walking among the churches, Jesus Christ walks among us. He observes he examines all of us and he knows. He knows each one of us, especially where our hearts are. And when you take that bread, remember those things. When you partake of that wine, remember the sacrifice, the shed blood. Remember what he went through. Remember all that he did. And he ultimately ended it and signed it. You might say he made a contract with us and he sealed it written and signed by his own blood on the document so to speak and that has opened the way ultimately for eternal life that is the greatest thing that we can take when we observe the Passover we can understand that that promise of eternal life is the ultimate reward what does Revelation 22 say I am coming and I'm bringing my reward with me. The promise of eternal life.